All right. Hello, everybody. We're going to give a few minutes for people to log in and get settled. Um, if you haven't done Zoom before, you're not going to be able to see yourself. You should see a little bird there on your screen, feathered friends, and we'll get started in a few minutes. If you have any questions or about the Zoom or about the program, you could put them down in the chat in the bottom, or there's a Q&A down in the bottom of the screen. If you hover your little mouse over the bottom, they pop up. Give a couple more minutes so people can straggle in. My cats are all like. <laughs> They're waiting for the birds. Yes, they are. They know what's going on here today. They're going to have fun. <laughs> okay. So welcome everyone to Master Gardeners Presents. This is our first one of the season. Um, we are here today at, with, um, this is brought to you by the Master Gardeners, Audi Gaming Cauldron Master Gardeners Association. Um, Tom Wenzel is a Master Gardener that plans all of these wonderful things and he's gonna tell us about what we're gonna talk about today. Yeah, and Jill is also a Master Gardener and this program started back in 2009. And because of your continued interest in this thing, we're uh, Glad to bring this back to you yet again. Our speaker tonight is Rob Zimmer. I'm sure you're familiar with him, talking about um, our feathered friends. Um, if you have any gardening questions uh, about feeding your feathered friends or miscellaneous gardening questions, you can get a hold of us at uh, Gardener SOS at altagamey.org and uh, we'll get back to you and I'll mention that next month's program is on native orchids and uh, you'll find that uh, Wisconsin has a lot more native orchids than Hawaii does so that's a little bit of an appetite wetter for next month. So in the meantime, I'll just turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Rob. All right, thank you. And welcome everybody. I'm gonna be going through my program talking about, I was asked to present a program on how to identify birds, attract them to your backyard and things to feed them. So I'm gonna talk about all of that as I go through the program. Um, and if you have questions, just uh, type them in. Jill's going to read them off to me, I think, as they come in. I can't see the chat uh, with my PowerPoint up. So if you have questions, just let me know. Feel free to ask throughout the program, or uh, if you want to save them to the end, we can do that too. I usually talk a lot, so I'm not sure how much time will be left over at the end. So here we go. So I'm talking about identifying, attracting, and feeding wild birds. I'm hoping a lot of you already do this or are interested in getting started in feeding wild birds. Even right in town, we're seeing more and more species of birds just right in town at Backyard Bird Feeders. So uh, there's so much opportunity out there. And winter is actually the best time to start uh, because uh, obviously food sources in the wild are, are getting down there, especially when we get heavier and thicker snow cover. So they're gonna be looking for some supplemental food sources. So this is a great time to get started feeding wild birds. So uh, if you haven't already liked me on Facebook, I'm at Facebook, uh, Rob Zimmer Outdoors. So. That is my Facebook page. And this little guy is one of my favorite birds. Hopefully you've all seen him. Whoops, my presentation is going on its own. <laughs> Not before too. So that is a white-breasted nuthatch. Excuse me. So I'm gonna be going through some of the common back bar backyard birds that you could see uh, in your area, even right here in the Fox Cities. This one is you probably all, all know, or many of you might know, is a cedar waxwing. These are gorgeous birds. They are pretty commonly seen in the winter. Oh, it keeps going by itself. Uh, they are pretty commonly seen in the winter. They have this beautiful kind of sleek plumage. 
black little robber mask uh, and a little crest on their head and they like berries. So if you have berries in your backyard, things like dogwoods and wild grapes and crab apples, uh, they're gonna love you. And they come through in flocks throughout the winter. And I'll talk more about those later as we go. Everybody loves cardinals and you probably all see them at your backyard feeders. I'll give you some tips uh, later on in how to bring them in uh, if you're not seeing any right now. Cardinals are very common in our area. Most of them do not migrate, so they're here all year long. Uh, and in fact, last week, if you're on my Facebook page, uh, I actually heard cardinals singing right here in Appleton and not just calling, but singing their spring song, which is pretty cool. And that's not totally unusual because usually they start singing about the second week in February. So uh, those guys were a couple weeks early, but not totally out of the woods or out of the realm of possibility. And he was singing away. They have that really loud, clear whistled kind of siren song. And of course, this is the male. Um, I don't think I have a picture of the female, but she's more brown in color with a pinkish orange bill and some, some washes of pinkish red over her body. This one is more of a summer bird, a spring and summer bird. This is related to the cardinal. This is the rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, and you can tell by that great big beak, just like a cardinal. Whoops, it keeps jumping ahead on me, sorry. Uh, this is the rose-breasted grosbeak. This is the male. They usually return in mid to late April in our area. And a lot of times when they first come back, they're gonna go to your feeders because they're looking for food. You know, when they first come back in, in April, there's not a lot of things blooming uh, yet, like these beautiful crab apples. So they're looking for things like sunflower seeds and safflower and things like that about the middle of April. So watch for them to return. The females uh, are similar in size, but they look like a great big brown sparrow. So you've probably seen them and maybe didn't even know it, but this is the male with the bright, bright rose colored breast. This one is a, oh gosh, <laughs> sorry about that. This one's a fun one. A lot of people mistake this guy for a sparrow or for a goldfinch because it has the yellow uh, on the wings and the tail. Uh, but this is called a pine siskin, um, S-I-S-K-I-N. And these guys come down and spend the winter here. So, you know, a lot of birds migrate south of us for the winter. This guy is actually migrating here from way up in the north. So pine siskins um, come to your bird feeders. They eat the same foods that goldfinches eat. They like the niger seed, you know, the little black seeds. And they eat uh, really tiny seeds. If you look at his beak, it's really tiny, really pointy. Uh, and that's used specifically in the wild to pry pine cone seeds out of pine cones. So uh, they're very specialized feeders and they like little tiny seeds uh, like the Niger seed. So look closely at your birds. If you see little brown birds or goldfinches, look really close at them and see if they're kind of streaked like this because you have pine siskins and they are here just during the winter. They're at, by April or May, they're gone. They're back up north. Now it won't go. Okay, here we go. So this is a hummingbird, of course. Hummingbirds come back usually in, um, usually the first or second week in May. Sometimes you get stragglers that come earlier. Um, whoops. Um, and hummingbirds, we only have one species in our area. That's the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, of course, I always tell people when I, when I spot the first one or know they're getting close, if you follow my page, I tell you to get your hummingbird feeders out there because they're close. And you know, one day they might be way down in Illinois and the next day they could be here, depending if we get a strong enough south wind. So once we start to see them in Illinois, it's usually time to get our feeders out here. And that can be as early as the middle of April sometimes. So, but normally the first big flocks of hummingbirds or big numbers of hummingbirds are back in the middle of May. And of course, we'll talk about hummingbird feeders uh, later in the program too. So this is a red-bellied woodpecker. <laughs> I was going the other way. Red-bellied woodpeckers, a lot of people probably see these at your feeder, especially if you feed peanuts or have suet blocks out there. These are really loud, noisy woodpeckers. And they're also beautiful. They have that uh, kind of red crest on top of their head or red crown to the top of their head, big beaks, and then their back, you can barely see it in this picture, it's kind of like they call it a ladder back, which is kind of black and white striped, uh, and that is the red-bellied woodpecker. There is another woodpecker called the red-headed woodpecker that has a solid red head, uh, but this is the red-bellied woodpecker, and this is actually a lot more common. This little guy is a house finch. House finches are really popular around here, really common, especially in the winter season. Like right now, you probably have a lot of these coming to your bird feeders. Gosh, a lot of these coming to your bird feeders. They love all the different seeds, sunflower seeds especially, that you put out. And they're also fruit eaters too. So if you have, again, a crab apple tree or wild grapes or nine barks or other apples or, or fruits in your yard, uh, you'll probably see them eating those too. Um, the house finches has just a little wash of bread around his head and his chest and the rest of his body is kind of brown like a sparrow and the females just all kind of brown and white. 
Uh, but house finches, they're, they're here all year long. Again, they nest here, they winter here. Uh, they're always here and they're really kind of bright, cheerful birds. Uh, they start to sing really early too. So usually about the time the cardinals start singing, the house finches start singing too. So listen for those guys to start singing away. This is one of our coolest woodpeckers. Uh, they usually just migrate through in the spring, but they will stop at your feeder, especially if you have suet out. Uh, this is a yellow-bellied sap sucker. So uh, they're not here all year like some of our other woodpeckers. They, they're just flying through during April, actually March to April when they're migrating through. But you can see in this picture, that little wash of yellow over his chest and that's where they get their name. And they're kind of interesting woodpeckers because uh, unlike most peckers that just hammer into the trees for insects, uh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker has kind of a creative way to eat. He just taps little bitty wells into the trees and huge lines and patterns, and then just waits for the sap to start to run. So they come back right about the time the sap starts to run in the forest trees, like the maples and birches, and they put these holes, these little shallow wells, and as soon as the sap starts to come uh, oozing out of those holes, they fly back to those and start lapping it up. Uh, so they're called sap suckers, even though they truly are members of the woodpecker family, uh, they're more interested in the sap than they are in insects like our other woodpeckers. All right, this is often mistaken for a bluebird. This is an indigo bunting, and a lot of you are probably lucky enough to get these at your feeders. Usually in May, they come back. Sorry, usually in May, they come back. They're about the size of that other guy, the goldfinch. They're a small little finch, uh, but they're really dark, dark, rich blue. And a lot of times you see them in April or May when uh, when you when the migrants are first turning to come back and they'll feed at your bird feeder just like goldfinches and other finches, but then they move on. They, they usually don't nest in town and they don't spend a lot of time in town. They're birds of open country in the, in the forest edge. So they're usually nesting where prairie meets woods and, and open areas and places like that. So that's the indigo bunting. The goldfinch of course is popular at feeders everywhere. They're, they're very um, numerous right now. Uh, I was just waiting for jump ahead. See, I knew I was gonna do that. <laughs> They're very popular or very numerous right now, except in winter, as a lot of you probably know, they don't have their um, bright yellow color anymore. They just have a little wash of yellow, maybe around their chest and their head, but generally they're just green overall, just like the females. So the males, uh, if you listen to my show last week, I was talking about this, we had a caller call in uh, and say also that the goldfinches are just starting to turn back to yellow right now. So. If you have goldfinches coming to your feeder every day, check them out because the males are starting to show their colors now and that'll get brighter and brighter and brighter over the next couple of months until they reach their peak color. Um, and this is an example here, this picture of things that you can plant to attract birds too. So it's not just throwing out bird seed and bird feeders and bringing birds in. You can draw a lot more birds with your, your gardening choices, your planting choices. And uh, obviously this is the Master Gardener Association. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the plants later on in the program that you can plant to bring in the birds. And really truthfully, a lot of birds would rather feed from wild sources of food like this or plants than come to a feeder. That's what they're built for. You know, in the wild, they feed off of, of weeds and, and wildflowers, and that's what they'd prefer to do in most cases. So that is a great shot there of the gardening. This is a pileated woodpecker. Some of you might be lucky enough to have these come to your, wood, um, your feeders. They like suet especially if you've ever seen these, uh, one of these on a little, you know, six inch square suet feeder, uh, they kind of overtake it. Pileated woodpeckers are huge. They're the biggest woodpecker that we have here in North America. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. They're the size of a crow or bigger. They have this huge, powerful bill, these huge feet uh, and this big crest on their head and they're red, white, and black. So they're a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to have one coming to your feeder regularly, uh, good for you. Uh, one of the easiest ways to attract them is just put out suet. They're usually found in areas where there are a lot of big mature trees. So if you're in part of the sea that has big mature trees, or if you live out in the country in the woods, you're probably more likely to see them um, than if you're in a newer subdivision without a lot of trees. All right, the bluebirds. Uh, some bluebirds never leave. They're here all winter long. A lot of them do kind of migrate out of the state for the winter and then return really early, like as early as March. In early April, they're back already. Now, this is the Eastern Bluebird, the, the one species that we have here in Wisconsin. Kind of like the indigo bunting, you're, you're not likely to see them in town. Um, bluebirds nest, um, they prefer to be in open areas out in the country. So 
if you live you know, out of town a little bit uh, next to a field or a woodland edge, you'll see bluebirds probably more likely than you're gonna see right in the city. Um, the ones that are here now this time of year, I'll talk about this later too, but the best way to attract bluebirds right now or to, to support them if they are at your feeder is to put out mealworms. They love mealworms. Um, and that's one of the best foods to feed birds overall in winter as I'll talk about uh, later. This little guy is kind of new in our area. This is called the tufted titmouse. Uh, it's actually a member of the chickadee family. And if you've ever seen one, they're the cutest little birds. They look like a, um, well, they're, they're gray on the top, white on the bottom, and they have a little crest, just like a cardinal. And they're super loud. If you've ever heard a tufted titmouse sing, they have a really loud ringing song uh, and they've already started singing. So if you go to Hackride Wetland Reserve or High Cliff uh, and other places, you can hear them already singing. For such a tiny bird, they have a really loud voice. But these are interesting birds because over the last 20 or 40 years or so, they've actually been moving north to the state and they're nesting further and further north every year. So about 10 years ago, we started seeing them right here in the Fox Cities. And now you see them regularly here in the Fox Cities. And now they're being seen as far north as Shano and Green Bay. So tufted tit mice are moving north in our area. And that's kind of interesting. Um, some people attribute, attribute that to global warming. Uh, because you know we've had warmer and warmer overall years over the past several decades uh, and some people just attribute it to the natural spread of the bird that used to be you know it used to be you'd never see a tufted titmouse north of madison or the state line and now they're all the way up to green bay and shano so hopefully you'll see these in your yard they eat all the same foods as chickadees they're fruit eaters too as you can see here he's munching down on some crab apples so cute cute little birds Juncos, this is kind of everybody's, one, one of everybody's favorite winter birds. Uh, they'll come to your feeder. They usually arrive in October or November, and they're kind of the bird that everyone says is kind of like the signature of fall or, or the clue that fall is here. And they are sparrows, kind of gray and white sparrows with so a gray upper side body and a white beneath, white beneath and a white little bill. And they're so fun to watch and um, enjoy as they flit around your backyard. They usually feed on the ground. They usually don't jump up on feeders, especially tube feeders. You might see them on a platform now and then, but generally they're gonna eat all the waste food that falls out of the feeder off the ground. They're ground feeders. And usually they come in flocks. You usually see quite a few of them. And then they're here until about March or early April, and then they fly back north. So these, like the other birds I've been talking about, they actually come here for the winter. They don't fly south. Well, they do fly south, but this is where they're headed. All right, and of course, here's the cardinals again. There's the female cardinal I was talking about before, if you uh, haven't seen one yet. They're beautiful birds, one of the favorite birds of everybody everywhere in Wisconsin. Uh, and if you have them at your feeders, great. Someone sent me a message from Amro um, last week or the week before uh, that they had 16 pairs of cardinals in their yard at their feeder. I just, I can't even imagine seeing that many cardinals in one spot, but 16. Uh, and especially when new snows come, like we just had, uh, well, if we have deeper or heavier snows, you can get a lot of cardinals that will come uh, to your feeders preparing for that snowstorm. And I'll talk more about what, what cardinals eat later. This is the white-breasted nuthatch, just a cute little bird with a little pointy bill. They're always running around. They're always busy. They're always kind of laughing. They have kind of a little yank, yank, yank call. Uh, they're taking tiny little pieces from your bird feeder. So the tiniest little scraps, little chunks of cracked corn, little bitty um, sunflower seeds, crushed peanuts and stuff. And a lot of times they're not eating it. They're just flying around to the trees and they're actually tucking it into the bark, uh, hiding it basically or caching it so that they can go back to that later and, and eat it uh, if the weather gets bad. So a lot of times half the food they take, they're not really even eating. They're just hiding throughout your yard or throughout the woods. They're such cute little birds. They actually run upside down like this on the trees and they just kind of run all over uh, and they're cute. Uh, whoops, saw that one already. This is another nuthatch. This is one we usually only see in the winter. This is the red-breasted nuthatch. So the white-breasted nuthatch, this guy, he's usually here all year. They nest right in our area. Uh, they actually nest in tree cavities, um, but they're always here. The red-breasted nuthatch, whoops, now I'm stuck. <laughs> the red-breasted nuthatch, because he's got a red breast and a little stripe through his eye. This guy usually comes here in the winter. So uh, they like the boreal forest up north. They like the evergreens and conifers. Uh, so this is where they're coming excuse me, in the winter, uh, but otherwise they behave just like the white-breasted nuthatches. They feed busily all day long, uh, and they're always kind of jumping around, frolicking around, um, 
from your feeder to the trees to hide their food or to eat. And they're usually around chickadees. Chickadees and juncos and other birds, they kind of all travel together in the winter for protection. All right, Orioles, of course, a lot of people's favorite bird. Orioles, whoops, Orioles come back usually uh, late April, early May is when you see the first Orioles. People like to feed them jelly. They like to feed them orange slices. There's, um, oh, darn it. There's Oriole like nectar feeders you can use just like hummingbird feeders. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Um, and there's all kinds of feeders you can provide, but they'll eat any fruit. You can just throw out apples or watermelon slices or bananas. They're attracted to all of that stuff, but they really seem to like the grape jelly. Uh, and there's all sorts of fancy feeders out there that you can buy, or you can just smear it on a board and they'll eat it off that too. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to bring in Orioles. One of everyone's favorite birds though, they nest in really big trees. So if you have a property with big trees, chances are they'll stay and nest there. Otherwise they might just pass through in May uh, to get to their breeding areas. Of course, the chickadee. Chickadees are everyone's, uh, one of everyone's favorite little birds at your feeders. Um, they're cute, you can get them, they're very tame. You can get them to feed out of your hand if you're patient enough and if you don't move a lot. Uh, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with up at Peninsula State Park, uh, where you can go to the nature center and they'll actually, they will actually come to your hand there. They're so well trained, but they're such cute little birds. They kind of warn all the other birds when you're around, they sing their little chickadee song. Uh, these guys were actually singing their spring song the other day also. Uh, I heard that at uh, Thousand Islands. Um, chickadees have their warning call, which is their chickadee dee dee call, but they also have a really sweet, um, they call it the cheeseburger song, where it sounds like they're saying cheeseburger, cheeseburger, and that's their spring song. They sound a lot higher than I did, um, but that's their spring song. And they were singing that the other day at Thousand Islands. So spring is almost here, despite the temperature. Turkey, some people are lucky enough to get these big guys at their feeders or, or unlucky enough, but I say enjoy them if you got them. They eat a lot, they eat a lot of corn, they eat a lot of peanuts, uh, whoops. But uh, turkeys are, are such a, a success story here in our area. You know, 30, 40 years ago, there were no turkeys here in the Fox cities and now they're walking down city streets. So it's kind of a, a conservation success story, if you will. Um, and, and usually there's big armies of them roaming around, even right in the middle of downtown Appleton, you'll see turkeys now. Where again, you know, a couple decades ago, you had to go way up north or way down south uh, to see them. They weren't just right around here. So, but they'll come to your backyard feeders too. And, and a lot of people put out corn on the cob and stuff specifically for them um, to eat. Speaking of peanut eaters, I was talking about that before. This is the blue jay. You probably have all seen one of these or had them in your feeders. Uh, they are, they're fun, they're noisy, they're demanding, they're easy to train and, and they can train you too. Uh, if your feeder is empty, they'll, they'll let you know. They'll squawk away. They might even knock on your window and tell you, hey, there's no peanuts out here. Um, and a lot of people can actually strike up a conversation with them. My friend Cindy, um, she can actually go out there and make certain calls and they will call back to her and um, they'll even mimic. So they mimic her cell phone and they mimic other things too. So blue jays are very intelligent. The whole crow, jay and magpie family, which includes the raven too. They're all very, very intelligent birds. Uh, of course, the morning dove, these are uh, a lot of people's favorite birds too. Um, they start singing pretty soon, usually the first week of February or so. They like corn and they like a lot of other foods too, but mostly if you put corn in your feeder, you should get some morning doves, whether it's whole or cracked. Robins, robins will come to feeders. There are some robins still in the area. Robins don't all leave during the winter. Some of them stay. Um, I see them a lot at High Cliff in the winter and Brilliant Nature Center and even down um, on the Newberry Trail. On the Newberry Trail by Lawrence University down below the hill, um, there's usually flocks of robins down there. Anywhere where there's a lot of berries in the winter, whether it's, even if it's buckthorn, I know buckthorn's invasive, uh, but robins will eat it. Uh, wild grapes. Um, high bush cranberry, crab apples, all those types of food um, will keep them around all winter. And if you have robins coming to your yard, one of the best things to do for them also, I talked about before with bluebirds, is to put out mealworms. Robins, um, they're insect eaters uh, a, lot of time, a lot of the year and fruit eaters. So if you throw out pieces of fruit, you know, watermelon rinds or orange slices or apples, even in the winter, the robins will come and eat that. Uh, even suet that has fruit pieces in it. So if you buy suet that has little chunks of cherries or cranberries or oranges, um, that's good for robins too. 
oops, this is the goldfinch again. This is what the goldfinches look like now. So you can kind of tell they don't, they don't have their yellow coloration yet, but they're just starting to. Uh, and of course, that's what they look like when they're yellow. All right, so here's some tips now for bird feeding. Um, my screen is kind of covered up. I guess I made it too big. <laughs> so I can't really read that. Let me go back. My presentation keeps jumping ahead. Okay, so just relax. A lot of people are really intimidated when they ask me or when they ask me or talk to me about bird feeding. Relax, it's not rocket science. It's very easy. You don't have to, you know, you'll see and you'll hear a lot of your friends and neighbors may be putting up these huge expensive feeding arrays and these huge expensive, you know, platforms and, and hooks and everything. Um, you don't have to do that. Bird feeding doesn't require any fancy equipment or expense. Uh, you could literally take a bunch of sunflower seeds in your hand and just go throw them on the ground and you're gonna bring birds in. You don't need to buy all these fancy feeders. Kind of like I was talking about before with the Orioles, you don't need to buy a fancy jelly feeder for your Orioles. You can take a board or just smear grape jelly on a tree trunk and they'll, they'll find it and they'll eat it. So don't be intimidated. Don't, don't think you're gonna do something wrong. Don't think you're gonna kill the birds. Um, bird feeding really is just a supplemental source of food for them. They're, get, they're still getting most of their food from the wild, which is, is as it should be. So you're not gonna do any harm by just tossing some food out there. Uh, one thing, obviously, you've probably heard a lot of times is just avoid things like white bread. White bread, there's not much nutrition in there for birds. Uh, just use at least some of the foods that I'm going to talk to you about later. But you don't need to buy some fancy expensive um, equipment to put it in. Uh, remember, there are a lot of businesses out there right now competing for your bird feeding dollars. All these marketing studies that show that bird feeding is huge business right now. It's one of the number one businesses, especially in the winter, uh, but also for hummingbirds and stuff in the summer too. So there's a lot of businesses out there competing for your bird feeding dollars, and not a lot of not all of them know a lot about birds. You know, they're just putting stuff out there hoping you'll buy it. Um, so don't be fooled by gimmick products and gimmick food sources. These magic things are going to attract birds. Blah blah blah. You know, your natural bird feed is best. So, uh, and you get what you pay for. So if you go cheap on food, if you're gonna go you know, to the, the dollar store and buy cheap food, um, you're likely just get a lot of fillers, which is gonna bring in a lot of the pest birds that uh, as you start feeding birds and get to feed birds for a while, you're gonna see that there, you wanna keep some of those away, especially birds like starlings and house sparrows. Uh, some people don't like those. Some people love them, um, but they eat a lot of food. So you get what you pay for. You're better off going to one of the specialized bird feeding shops in our area. And we have a couple right here in the Fox Cities. There's Wild Bird and Backyard uh, over by, by Woodman's. They're awesome. They have everything you need right there. And it's high quality natural food uh, in all different blends and all different um, custom blends and blends for certain types of birds. So if there's something specifically you want to attract, they'll, they'll tell you what to get. And if there's a specific um, feeder you're looking for, they'll recommend the best one. You know, they're not going to recommend a gimmick feeder that doesn't work. They're going to recommend something high quality, dependable, and proven. So uh, there's also the Wild Perch and Paw down in Nina. That's another great one. So we have several specialized bird feeding shops right here that you can go to. You know, you don't have to buy your, your food at, you know, the big box store. You know, there's also um, uh, in Hortonville, the Black Otter Feed Mill. That's a great source of, of really good um custom made food blends for birds. So all of those places are specialty bird feeding shops and they're gonna have the right answers for you uh, and reliable knowledgeable solutions when problems do arise. So again, support them rather than the big box stores because they're gonna help you get the most out of your bird feeding um, experience. All right, hopefully this will work. So with that being said, um, even though I said it is easy, it's a no brainer, it's not rocket science. Once you put out a feeder, whoops. Once you put out a bird feeder, you are kind of taking on a bit of responsibility to assume a very few simple basic things. So uh, once you start to feed, there's some things that you should do. So gosh, it just wants to jump ahead on me. I'm not even touching it. All right, so keep the, fill, keep the feeders well stocked during whatever seasons you choose to feed. Not everybody feeds all year. Some people just feed in the winter. Some people just feed in the summer. Some people just feed Orioles and hummingbirds and don't care about the rest. Whenever you do have your feeder out there, keep it well stocked, okay? You also wanna keep the feeders clean and healthy. Like anything else, uh, the easiest way to clean them is just bring them inside, clean them with a 10% bleach solution every two weeks or so. 
um, more frequently when it's hot out. So in the summer, um, you want to do that almost every other day or so, or at least once a week. Some of y'all heard last summer when they had, um, not really here in Wisconsin, but east of us in Indiana and some of the eastern states, they had that issue where a lot of birds were getting diseased um, from feeding at feeders because the feeders weren't being cleaned um, because people tend to forget that part. Uh, you know, just like we forget a lot of other things, we forget that those feeders do need to be cleaned regularly. And when it's really super hot and humid, a lot of funguses and diseases can um, build up on those feeders. And if you don't clean them, they can be um, passed from bird to bird. So um, especially during the hot weather, make sure you keep those feeders clean and keep cats away from your feeder area too, or keep them indoors. Let them enjoy the birds like you are from inside um, because cats really do um, unfortunately take a lot of feeder birds uh, if they, you know, if they come to your yard and it's not always your cats, it could be stray cats from the neighborhood or neighbor cats. But once they spot a feeder, you know, they'll keep watch on that because of course cats like to play with birds. <laughs> So kind of keep your cats inside. Um, you can attract a wider variety of birds by providing a variety of food sources. Say that 10 times fast. So uh, in the example here, there's some corn, there's some peanuts and a cute little feeder. The more variety of foods you provide in your yard, the more variety of birds you're gonna get. Um, if you just buy a bag of general bird seed that has a little bit of everything in it, you know, um, that's not always ideal. It might be ideal uh, to provide a special feeder like this for peanuts and a special feeder for corn uh, and move them throughout the yard because then you're going to attract more birds than just a, a pile of, of filler. And again, when you buy those mixes, there are a lot of filler, especially millet. A lot of birds don't like millet. It's just in there to make the bag look fuller. Um, some birds do like it though. I shouldn't, I, you know, some not all, but uh, that tends to attract a lot of your pest birds. So if you go specialty foods like this, you'll get less of those pest birds and more of the birds that you want. So um, these are favorite foods by species, or at least some species in here. Excuse me. So diner's choice, favorite food. I knew that was going to happen. Don't, don't peek. Don't look ahead. <laughs> diner's choice, favorite foods by species. So um, the number one basic food source that, that most bird feeders feed is black oil sunflower seed. That's the little tiny black shiny sunflowers. Uh, that specifically is really the number one wild food source for all, all birds. Um, and of course, you want to get it at a reputable local sourced, uh, a local feed store rather than, you know, big box store because you never know where it's coming from. Um, but it attracts cardinals, chickadees, finches, just about everything, nut hatches, anything that can eat it. It's a smaller seed, so it's not a huge, huge sunflower seed. So more of the smaller birds can eat it. And it's very easy for them to crack. So black oil sunflower seed, if you feed nothing else, that would be a top choice right there. Um, whole peanuts. Lots of different birds like peanuts, and, and when I say whole, I mean not even not even out of the shell. You know, just the peanuts you buy at the bird food store that are still in the shell. Blue jays love those. Woodpeckers love those. Turkeys love them. They're a lot of fun for those birds, actually. If you've ever watched them take a whole peanut and kind of peck at it, especially woodpeckers, they peck at it just like a, everything else, and then they rip the peanut out and go away. Blue jays, sometimes they swallow the whole thing. Uh, otherwise, they fill their, their throat patch with that, and then they fly away with a huge... Um, puff in their throat and that's all peanuts. Uh, but they like to, to peck those open too and they have strong bills. Safflower seeds. Oh, safflower seeds. Somebody oh. has a question. Should the peanuts be salt free? Um, it doesn't really matter. I know people who, who feed salt pe salted peanuts just from you know Fleet Farm and stuff. Uh, normally if you buy them at a, bir a bird feeding store, a bird food store specifically, they're unsalted. But I know people who just go to Fleet Farm and buy little bags of peanuts and throw them out there and, and everybody eats them. Uh, and not just birds, you have squirrels and chipmunks and stuff too. Ideally, you know, when you buy them at a specialty bird food store, they're generally unsalted, just like the, the shelled peanuts do. They're, um, they're not salted, so, okay, good question. Okay. Uh, the next one, safflower seed. Uh, if you don't know what safflower seed is, it's the one in the picture here, those little white seeds. Um, it, it doesn't look like much, but it's actually one of the most expensive <laughs> bird feeds there is, but if you're looking to attract cardinals and grosbeaks uh, and some of the bigger finches, like um, some of the, the crossbills and the purple finches and some of those, um, safflower seed is a good one. And the nice thing about safflower too, if you're feeding straight safflower with nothing else, it keeps a lot of the pest birds away, like starlings and red-winged blackbirds and house uh, sparrows. It keeps a lot of those birds away. And a lot of studies show that squirrels and chipmunks don't like it either. either. 
So it can be more expensive, but it is a specialty food uh, that a lot of people swear by, especially for cardinals and finches. So, uh, and a lot of people grow their own too. It's got a really cool uh, flower. Niger seed or thistle seed, that's the little tiny black, they look like little black hooks. Um, those a lot of times you put in a tube style feeder or even a sock feeder. Uh, goldfinches, pine siskins, common red poles, a lot of your little birds, chickadees, nuthatches, they all like the niger seed or the thistle seed. Um, a lot of people too, well, I'll talk about that later. Uh, suet, suet cakes, or you can make your own, however you want to do it. Woodpeckers, nuthatches, robins, um, just about everything like suet, uh, especially if you get suet that has little pieces of you know, peanuts or fruit or anything else in it. And some of those are amazing. It's like you want to eat them. Like there's one called like orange cheesecake or cherry cheesecake or something. Uh, it's just incredible. And I just want to like lick it because it looks so good. Uh, but the birds love it, especially when they have fruit and stuff in them. Uh, there are suets that you can feed all year. They don't melt. So if you look for no melt suets, you can feed it all summer. Uh, if you have homemade suet, generally that's just for winter because once the temperatures get above 50 or so, it can tend to kind of get rancid. So um, otherwise get the home, uh, the the store-bought suet cakes. And they're really inexpensive. You can usually get suet cakes for like a dollar or a dollar fifty and get several different kinds and just kind of hang them throughout your yard. And then there's corn, cracked corn or whole, cracked or whole corn, um, turkeys, ducks, cardinals, sparrows, morning doves, all of these birds love corn, whether it's cracked or whole. Uh, turkeys, especially like corn on the cob. So you can just throw corn on the cob out there. Ducks will eat it that way too. Uh, and some people are actually lucky enough to have ducks at their bird feeders. Uh, even right in town, you have, uh, one of my friends was telling me they have a, a whole flock of ducks that flies from the river into their backyard feeder every night around sunset and then takes off and flies back to the river and they're eating the corn that they throw out. So kind of a cool, cool experience. And geese too, if you're, if you're living along the river or the lake and you have geese, uh, they like corn also. Great food source for them too. Where can you get well, the cracked corn? Cracked corn, usually any of the bird feed stores or um, sometimes like some of the big box stores will have it too, like Fleet Farm and stuff. Um, it's usually more expensive than whole corn, um, but it's already cracked. So you get a lot, a lot for your money. But um, Probably either tractor way, supply. What did you say? Tractor um, supply. Oh, tractor it supply. Yes. Field. Yep. Good, good suggestion. Yep. Excellent. So cracked corn is really good. And again, any of these foods, like I was saying before, you don't need to have a special fancy feeder to feed them with. You can take any of these or a mixture of these and just toss them on the ground and you're going to get birds. You don't have to have a fancy feeder. Um, you can, of course. Um, the suet, you know, sometimes the suet you probably want to have in something, either a dish or one of the, the hanging suet feeders that you can get um, at the dollar store. Usually it's just a wire feeder. You can make your own out of, of chicken wire or something. Um, but none of these foods really need to go in something fancy. Um, so don't be intimidated by that. So many people tell me, well, I, I'm gonna spend half my money on, on bird seed and bird feeders. You really don't have to. So don't let that intimidate you. Uh, this is one of my favorite winter treats. These are mealworms. And a lot of people grow, get grossed out when I tell them this, but mealworms are one of the most important things that you can feed birds right now in the winter because um, you know, there's not a lot of protein out there. They're eating a lot of weed seeds and, and corn and um, the seeds from your, your bird feeder. But mealworms, especially if you have bluebirds or robins in the area, if you've seen bluebirds or robins in your area or at your feeder, get some mealworms and throw them out there. They don't have to be live. You don't have to buy the live mealworms that might creep you out. You know, <laughs> you can get the dried ones. And most of all, all of the bird feed supply stores should have these. Uh, sometimes they're frozen. Sometimes they're just in a little um, um, vacuum sealed jar or container. Again, some, for, to some people, they look kind of gross, especially the live ones, but the dried ones, they're just basically transparent shells of the, of the um, worm, the, the, the caterpillar, the grub. So feed them. As you can see here, this bluebird is, this is the Eastern bluebird. Uh, she's got her mouth full there. She's probably going back to the nest with these. So uh, mealworms, you can actually feed all year long, but during the winter, especially if you have robins or bluebirds or cedar waxwings or catbirds, any of these birds that are kind of rare here in the winter, mealworms gives them a really good treat. Uh, and really everything likes these. Chickadees go crazy over them. Nuthatches go crazy over them. So do yourself a favor and get some mealworms. You can, again, just scatter them on top of the snow or you can just put them in a little dish 
um, a little tuna can or something and set it out there on the, on the patio or the porch or on a stump or something, and they will love you for that. And don't be afraid of them. Again, just buy the dead dried ones if you have to. But um, mealworms are an excellent, excellent choice in the winter for birds. Suet too, I was talking about suet before. These are some of the flavors that are out there. I call them flavors, <laughs> like, like candy. But there are so many cool um, flavors of suet. Uh, you can see here, they make a woodpecker blend. Um, there's a nuts and berry blend, a wild bird blend, a peanut blend. There's blueberry, there's orange. Uh, there's an apple one that's amazing uh, and a cherry one. Uh, there's so many different uh, flavors of, of suet uh, that really do work to bring in the birds. So. And suet is such an easy food to feed uh, all year long. So that is an also a, a great source of food. Bring in a wider variety of birds by feeding in multiple locations. So that you're gonna increase your number of birds by putting out feeders in different locations. So if you just put up one feeder in the middle of the yard, you know, you, you might not get as many birds as if you put out several feeders in several different sections of the yard. So here's an example of a two feeder um, and then just throwing stuff on the ground for the juncos because juncos are usually ground feeders. So bringing a wider variety of birds by feeding in multiple locations instead of just relying on one. So, and that, again, that doesn't mean you have to have fancy feeders in each location. It can be throwing some on the ground. It could be putting a, a board on a stump and making like a little table and dumping a bunch of stuff on there. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you're gonna get more birds if you put different types of food in different places. Okay, so bringing in the birds, where do birds prefer to eat? So these are some of their choices. Oops, these are some of the places that are some of the options that are out there. So ground or platform feeders. So platform feeders are just the flat feeder uh, that the birds can just fly on and fly away from quickly to escape predators and to just grab some food and go. Um, there are also some really cool new platform feeders that are actually only a few inches above the ground. You can buy like these six or eight inch tall tables basically to put your bird feed on, or you can make one with just some screen, you know, take an old window screen, set it on top of a couple cinder blocks and you have your, your platform feeder, very easy to do. So, um, and window screens, you can get to the thrift store, you might even have some sitting in your garage or in your basement and just lay them on top of some bricks and throw some food on there and you're done. Uh, tube feeders, which are the long tubular feeders, obviously, uh, they can be either plastic or glass or metal or just the nylon socks or the mesh socks that you can just fill with seed. Uh, so many birds, especially your smaller birds like your finches and chickadees and nuthatches love those tube style feeders. Suet feeders, which come in a number of different styles. Usually they're just a little cage that you can pop open and tuck the suet block in and hang it somewhere. Hopper feeders, those are the kind of the fancy ones that look like kind of like a barn. They have like a little roof on them and a hopper that you open up and put in the food and it kind of comes out the bottom kind of like a um, a dog food feeder actually. Um, those are popular. A lot of birds love them um, because they can handle just about at most size birds, um, fairly large birds and small birds. Nectar feeders like your hummingbird feeders and your oriole feeders. Those are a great feeder uh, obviously for summer, spring and summer, uh, but also well into fall. Fruit feeders, uh, which can be really as simple as this one off here to the right, which is just uh, an orange slice stuck on a stick. Uh, that's all you really have to do. You don't have to buy a fancy, again, fruit feeder. You can just cut some fruit and stick it on a twig like that. Uh, and you don't have to have any feeder at all. Like I said, you can just throw stuff on the ground. You can uh, do other stuff like plant food for the birds, which I'll talk about uh, in the program too. Different things that you can plant. So if you don't have a feeder or don't want to have a feeder, again, you can just toss stuff out there either on your patio, on the ground, on a chair, whatever you want to do. But make sure that you provide food in different places throughout the yard to attract the best variety of birds. Uh, squirrels, gotta talk about squirrels because a lot of people, uh, oh, sorry. As somebody had a question about the placement of feeders. Um, like where's the best place to put a suet feeder? They put one out and it doesn't get any birds. Like, uh, uh, the best place, um, well, there's, it, it depends. Um, I've seen people put them right on their window with a suction cup and the birds come right to the window, but it, obviously it takes them a little while to get used to that. Uh, I like to hang them or even just like nail them right to a tree. If you have a tree or a fence, hang it from the fence or the tree. Um, sometimes it does take a couple of weeks. I was going to talk about later in the program. Sometimes if you move feeders around and stuff, um, birds don't instantly find that. Some birds might, but it might take birds a couple of weeks to get used to uh, 
um, where you can move that to and define that and come back again. But sewage feeders can pretty much go anywhere. Um, if you're gonna be watching, obviously you wanna put it somewhere where you can see it. I mean, feeding the birds should be as much about your enjoyment uh, as theirs, uh, which is why, you know, like I, like I mentioned, I have a couple of friends who literally suction cup them right to the window and the birds will actually come right to the window and eat off that once they're comfortable enough. Uh, but if you can hang them um, from a fence or a tree or just nail the feeder or mount the feeder on the tree, um, that would be great too. And, and really, it, you don't even need to have a feeder. I know, I know lots of people who just take suet cakes, again, and smear them onto the bark of the tree and that's all they do. So mm -hmm. you could try that too. But eventually they'll find it, so don't be discouraged. And speaking someone, of discouraged, oh. Someone also asked if they put an orange out, would it get eaten now? Yes, I, yeah, I was gonna say that. I think it's coming up later in the program. Now is actually a really good time to put out fruit. There are so many birds, house finches. Um, and again, if there's any robins straggling around the area or bluebirds, um, cedar waxwings love fruit. You can put out fruit now. You can even put out just like watermelon rind, um, orange slices, apple slices. I have a section coming up. I don't know if I'm gonna get to the whole thing uh, on thinking beyond the feeder where I talk about the fruit. So uh, you'll see some examples of that. Okay. Even just your fruit scraps, like I said, watermelon rinds or whatever you might have melon. Um, if you put that out right now, and especially if you listen to my show and I tell you there's robins in the area, that's kind of your clue to get the fruit out because um, you never know when they're gonna stop by. If you're, if you're working all day, you never know if they might come in there for 10 minutes and eat and leave. So um, it, it probably will get eaten now by a lot of those different birds I talked about. Even woodpeckers will eat the, the oranges and melon and stuff. So good job. And then keep going all summer with that. So discouraging squirrels. I, have, I can't talk about bird feeding without squirrels. <laughs> a lot of people are kind of, um, you, you got to keep in mind that the reason you have squirrels or the reason we have so many squirrels right now in town is because we're feeding birds. So you have to remember that. Don't complain too much about them because the reason they're here is because of us. It's not like they just, they're just, they just, um, you know, out there populating the city. There's so many of them because we're feeding birds. So you have the two go hand in hand. So um, just don't hate on them. The other day was National uh, Squirrel Appreciation Day and I kind of uh, stressed that too. The only reason we have a lot of squirrels is because we have more people than ever feeding birds. You can try a squirrel proof feeder. There are lots of different styles out there, depending who you talk to, like, like every car there is out there, every feeder is going to have both pros and cons to it. Every feeder that's out there, you know, some people are going to hate them, some people are going to love them. Um, they do work or they wouldn't be out there on the market. You do have to use them right and assemble them right. I know people who buy squirrel proof feeders and then put them together wrong and then wonder why they don't work. So uh, that's why I said before, the best thing, well, it's coming up later. I'll shut up. Uh, place your feeder correctly. Uh, that's the one that most people don't want to hear. If they're really serious about getting rid of squirrels or keeping squirrels away, sometimes it means a little sacrifice. And that means putting your feeder somewhere uh, far enough away from trees, far enough away from the top of your house or any outbuildings and stuff where they can't get up there. You know, some people say, well, I want to have my feeder right here. Well, if that's right beneath a tree or right beneath an overhang where a squirrel can just jump right to it, uh, you're going to have squirrels. So Sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit. Uh, and that's something that is hard for some people to swallow. So, but if you're serious about getting rid of them, consider moving your feeder. And if you're not sure where to put it, again, if you visit one of our local bird feeding stores, they'll tell you, they'll make their recommendations. You can take a picture of their yard. Sometimes they'll, they'll come over to your yard and tell you where to put it. Um, so that's the way to find out exactly where to put it. But generally it has to be a certain number of feet away from a tree or the roof of a house or an outbuilding or a fence, um, which may not always be where you can see it easily, but to keep squirrels away, it might be the best answer. Uh, the next one too, a lot of people don't wanna do, but um, it'll work. If you avoid feeding corn, peanuts and other squirrel favorites, they won't come. So if you stick to just thistle seed or safflower or other things, you'll see less squirrels. Um, but of course you get a lot more birds if you feed these other things too. But if you really have a serious squirrel problem, you might want to switch just to some of the thistle seed or something else just for a short time, maybe a couple of weeks, and then go back to the regular stuff later. The other thing you can do that I kind of like is just give them their own feeder or their own feeder area somewhere. There are a lot of really fun squirrel feeders out there where you can mount, you know, corn on the cob on 
spinners like Ferris wheels and the squirrels jump on there and they go round and round and round. And, uh, all different cool feeders that you can use uh, to feed squirrels that'll keep them busy and keep them off of your bird feeder. So you could give that a try. Now the next one, uh, there are squirrel guards and baffles for most feed for bird feeders. The key is to correctly install them. Uh, a lot of people get them and put them on and they're either too tight where they don't do any good or they're upside down, which is kind of funny, but it's true. People do put them on upside down and then it makes basically just makes a little chair for the squirrel. So if you're not sure how to put it together, again, go to one of these reputable local, reputable local bird feeding shops and ask about new and proven products. They're always coming out with something new, especially when it comes to squirrels and deer and stuff. So visit one of our local shops and ask them, tell them what you're experiencing and they'll give you some examples. And like I said, they're gonna give you something that's proven and reliable not just some cheap gimmick product. So again, Wild Bird Backyard in Appleton, Wild Bird and Paw in Nina, all those places have the experts right there. And remember you get what you pay for. So if you're gonna go cheap, um, they might not work. <laughs> so um, that's why you go to a reputable place. All right. That's birds, this is another big concern when it comes to bird feeding. And sorry for all the words here, no pretty pictures, but there's a lot of good information here. And I'm just waiting for it to jump there, did. All right, so discouraging fast birds. Kind of like I've been saying, if you feed high quality bird food, that's kind of the key to discouraging pest birds. And by pest birds, I'm specifically talking about red winged blackbirds and starlings, house sparrows, you know, birds that most people don't necessarily want. They want the colorful birds, they want the fun birds. Um, not that red winged blackbirds aren't colorful, but um, uh, they like to, those birds eat a lot of food. So if you go cheap, if you buy cheap bird seed, you get a lot of filler that just attracts those pest birds. So spend the extra couple of bucks and buy a bag of really good high quality food uh, and that'll keep away some of the pest birds. Some of the pest birds such as red winged blackbirds, starlings and others are only going to be a problem for a few weeks each year. It's usually during migration, usually in the spring that these birds are a problem. You get huge flocks of red winged blackbirds that come in before they spread off into their, their breeding areas and they eat a lot. So if you can put up with them just for a couple of weeks, it, they usually go away. Um, some bird feeders do choose, if they're in a really high population area for red winged red -wing blackbirds, they might even take down their feeders for a couple of weeks until those birds move on to their breeding areas. So if you have a lot of red winged blackbirds, chances are they're not gonna be there all the time. It's just gonna be a couple of weeks during the spring migration and then they're gone off doing their own thing. Um, or you could just live with them because everybody has to eat. They're all birds, right? <laughs> can't judge, can't discriminate. Uh, you could just let them eat and just spend a few extra bucks on seed for those couple of weeks. Um, another thing for starlings specifically, if you have a starling problem, starlings have pretty soft bills compared to most other seed eating birds. So if you provide things with hard shells like peanuts in the shell or whole kernel corn, or corn on the cob or the big striped sunflower seeds, which are different from the black oil, the, the, the black and white striped ones, those might discourage your starlings. And again, if you just do that for a couple of weeks, even just until they move off, um, that's a great way to discourage some of the starlings specifically. Um, another thing you can do is when these kind of birds show up, the blackbirds and starlings and uh, those, switch to just your tube feeders or sock feeders just for that time, because those birds are too big to get on those usually. And you're not going to find, you know, a, I'm not going to say they never will but it, you're, it's not gonna be as common to see a red winged blackbird or a starling or a grackle and grackles cover are covered in all this too. You're generally not gonna see those hanging from your little tube feeders or sock feeders. So switch that, switch to those just for a couple of weeks again during migration when they are uh, most common. And the other thing, like I said before, feed safflower strict or straight because many pest birds find that distasteful and they'd rather have you know the junk food. Like I said, the, the millet and some of the other, the other stuff, so. Those are all good ways to discourage pest birds from coming to your feeder. Now I'm really losing my voice. All right, bird feeding reminders. So excuse me, bird feeding should always be considered a supplemental source of food to the bird's natural diet. So you don't, don't ever think that you're, you know, their sole source of food, that you're, you're keeping them alive. Birds consider you a supplemental source, even if they come a lot. Uh, you're still their supplemental source. There's so many things out there that they're eating in the wild that you don't even know. They're eating bugs, they're eating caterpillars, they're eating things way up in the treetops. They're eating all sorts of stuff that you don't know. So your bird feeding is always just a supplemental source of food for them. Um, so don't stress yourself out thinking that 
you know, they're going to die without you because they're not, they, they have plenty of other food and chances are there's houses, two or three houses away from you that are feeding. So they have plenty of other options out there. So uh, birds move, birds fly, they come and go, uh, get to know the common birds first and you'll quickly recognize possible rare ones. There are a lot of rare birds that show up in Wisconsin at bird feeders, especially right now in the winter. We get a lot of Western birds from the mountain states that actually come this way each year in the winter. They're kind of just wandering. Uh, and some of them are hummingbirds. There's Rufus hummingbirds and Anna's hummingbirds that are sometimes seen here in the winter. Uh, and there's buried thrushes and Townsend solitaires. And sometimes we see mountain bluebirds in the, summer, in the winter. So there's all sorts of rare birds that can come in this way. Um, and sometimes they show up just right in town at someone's backyard bird feeder. Uh, a couple of months or last month, uh, there was a varied thrush, which is a, a Western bird from Washington and Oregon that someone found at their backyard bird feeder in Sheboygan. And all these people from all around the state went to see it and it was really cool. Um, and I'll show a picture of one coming up later. But uh, you never know what's gonna show up. So if you can at least get to identify, get yourself a good guidebook and identify the common birds, then you'll know when something unusual comes in and you can get a picture of it and see if you can identify it. Uh, take the good with the bad, everybody has to eat, like I said, there's going to be squirrels, there's going to be chipmunks. Uh, I gave you a lot of good tips already for how to discourage those. There's going to be blackbirds and grackles. I gave you tips to discourage those. Um, deer, a lot of the same things I mentioned. Deer are a little bit tougher because you can't really, uh, unless you get a, a completely enclosed feeder, there's not much you can do, uh, especially if you're feeding corn. But um, uh, deer got to eat too, right? <laughs> you can hang your feeders really high where the deer can't eat it, um, but there's not much else you can do for deer. Keep feeders clean and stocked and bird baths fresh and clean. Those are important, especially when it's warm weather. Usually when it's below 50 or so, it's okay. But once we get into the heat of summer, you really wanna keep those feeders clean and bird baths clean. Because as you probably know, they can get full of algae and, and dirty really quick. So uh, now I wanna talk about just some, some ways to feed birds that don't have anything to do with a feeder. So think outside the feeder, just some fun little options that you can do. Of course, everyone knows hummingbird feeders, right? Uh, so you can feed hummingbirds this way. But there are some other great ways. Someone just asked about oranges. You can put fruit out there in the summer and spring and they'll just eat right off that. And here's proof, if you don't believe me. They'll eat right off of watermelon and melon, cantaloupe, whatever, apples, oranges, and you can just put them right out there. Oranges for Orioles, obviously, but you can use oranges for other things too. You can pack them full of peanut butter and bird seed. Uh, you can put them on different hangers like this. So just, I'm trying to get you guys to think outside just your normal standard bird feeder for different ways to feed some of these birds. You can use a suet feeder to put oranges in. You can hollow out the orange and fill it with peanut butter uh, and bird seed and oatmeal, whatever you wanna do. That makes a cute little bird feeder. Great if you have kids too. These are all great ways to get kids into watching birds and feeding birds too. Excuse me. Kind of, been, kind of cool here, they wired some grapes and or cranberries, whatever those are, with some bird seed and peanut butter to make a cool little feeder. What, right now is the best time to do a lot of this because all of these birds are looking for that extra protein. Cat birds love oranges too. And again, this one didn't need a fancy feeder. They just tucked it onto a, a crab apple twig. This is kind of a cool, in a frozen bird bath, just mandarin oranges and looks like that dragon fruit stuff and some little berries and strawberries and orange slices. Here they're strung up apples, walnuts, cranberries, just on some string and hung. So all different fun ways that you can feed birds without just your standard bird seed and bird feeder. You've probably all done this, the toilet paper roll, rolled in peanut butter and then rolled in bird seed. It works and it's fun, especially again for kids, if you have kids. Um, this is a really cool way to display them, but the birds love it. And it's so easy and it's a great nature craft if you have kids at home. Uh, this is just rotten apples <laughs> mounted on an old um, chandelier hook or, or light fixture. And again, robins are great fruit eaters. If you put out apples right now when there's robins in the area, they'll find it. You can use your pumpkins as bird feeders. A lot of people do this and then the birds will eat the pumpkin too. It's a great nutritious uh, food source for them. Dried apples, if you have a food dehydrator or just cut them up and hang them out there. Um, these are great food sources for wax wings and finches and cardinals and robins. Here's some strung up, making some fancy um, garland to hang around bushes and shrubs. And again, pine cones rolled in peanut butter and then bird seed, another great way to feed birds. That little chickadee, that's a big pine cone. Look how tiny that chickadee looks on there. 
Uh, the kind of slinky feeders with peanuts. Uh, these are good for squirrels, but they're also good for blue jays and woodpeckers. They'll come and take the peanuts right out of there. And it kind of makes it a little bit fun. And a lot of people take their old Christmas trees and stick them in the backyard in the snow and then just kind of decorate that the birds for the rest of the year. And here you have grapefruit slices and just little cardboard cutouts with suet, uh, peanut butter and suet on them. So very easy to do again, if you have kids especially, or if you just want to do it for fun, slice up some fruit, make some of that garland I showed you before, take little cardboard cutouts, coat them in peanut butter and bird seed, and just make a very beautiful tree for the birds. They'll love you so much for it. Uh, Cardinals, this is the very thrush that I was going to show you before. This is what was in Sheboygan. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing bird. They're normally only found like in British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. And they're in the robin family. So a lot of times you see them with flocks of robins. They kind of look like a robin just with that black mask and black necklace around their face. Um, but it was a really cool bird. And someone just noticed it sitting in their bird bath with the robins. So if you see robins this time of year, always check those flocks closely with binoculars because chances are there could be one of these guys in. Every year, several show up in Wisconsin. And the reasoning, nobody knows. They just kind of drift west or drift east uh, during winter. Instead of going north and south, these guys just drift east and they show up every year right here. I think this one I actually took a picture of in Menasha. Several years ago, there was one in Menasha that was spotted uh, right in the middle of town at someone's bird feeder. And like I was saying before, a lot of times robins and then these two come to crab apple trees or trees with fruit. So you can see this is a crab apple uh, and that drew the robin flock with this guy. So be on the alert for these guys right now. This is the time of year they're here. So some, do I have any time? How much time do I have left? As much time as you need. Oh, good, okay. I didn't know if I just had an hour or what. So, all right, so I wanna give you some food choices. Since this is a gardening program, I wanna give you some things that you can plant that make excellent sources of food for birds. And I'll just go through this really quickly. Um, but here's one example. Uh, purple coneflower, we talked about that, just your old fashioned purple coneflower, one of the best overall sources of food for birds, those big spiny seeds. Chickadees will eat them all winter, goldfinches, tree sparrows, um, all these different birds will eat them all winter long. And when they come back, even in the spring, you'll see house wrens and all different birds eating those um, purple coneflower seeds. So it's one of the best plants, not just for butterflies, but for birds too. So what are some of the best plants for birds? Uh, this is one of them right here too, crab apples, especially uh, not just for the, the flowers, like this guy's on there in the flowers. Oops, don't cheat. <laughs> a lot of times you see birds in the branches of crab apple trees and fruit trees in the spring, not because they're eating the flowers, but some do, like Orioles do, but they're there catching the bugs that come to those flowers. They're there catching bees and insects that come to those flowers too, uh, to feed. So they're a great uh, food source for insect eaters like bluebirds and some of the other ones. But uh, some of the plants, they're more than just pretty flowers. So you want to choose plants for birds that offer berries and fruit and seeds and nectar and nuts and shelter whoops, and nesting space. So all of these different plants, and a lot of people think of you know butterflies or just beauty in their garden, but anything that provides these things is also a great source of food for birds. Uh, this is bee balm, which a lot of people don't think of as a bird plant. Um, but hummingbirds absolutely love bee balm. So there you go. All right, uh, some specific plants for hummingbirds because I get this question a lot. Um, a lot of times you need a shrub. You need shrubs in your yard for the hummingbirds to go to for shelter. You know, if they're going to their feeder, you know, they get pretty twitchy, pretty nervous. If you provide a shrub, they can go there and rest like this. Uh, and if you didn't know he was there, you know, he might be invisible. So they need shelter uh, in the form of shrubs. So shrubs are always good to plant. Blue pine is a great source of food for hummingbirds. It's one of the only things blooming when they come back in May. Wild blue pine, the, the truly wild stuff, blooms in May when they first come back. Uh, and you'll see them if you if you know areas where it grows, like Mosquito Hill or Navarino or areas west of us, like Nesita, um, when, when the lupines in bloom, you'll see little hummingbirds darting back and forth around that lupine. So it's a great source of, of nectar for them. This is one of the salvias called Wendy's Witch, which is the popular with a lot of gardeners. It's a great big, tall kind of magenta or fuchsia colored um, salvia. They love that one. Fuchsias, hummingbirds just love fuchsias because of the bell-shaped flowers. They're so rich in nectar. And a lot of people have hummingbirds come to their fuchsia baskets. Um, that's not a plant, but it is a hummingbird feeder. <laughs> you can put out one of those. 
Um, pastas, another surprising food source for hummingbirds. They love hostas, especially late in the season. When you get into September and October, when a lot of the late hostas are blooming, you'll see hummingbirds sometimes just hovering among those little towers of flowers, feeding away. Um, and bumblebees love hosta flowers too. Trumpet honeysuckle, this is one of my favorite plants for hummingbirds in general. Um, it's a, a native vine, uh, not a shrub. It's a vine with long tubular flowers that are red and yellow, or there's a gold version too. And the hummingbirds love it. And it's not the woody a kind of aggressive trumpet creeper. That's different. This is the herbaceous vine. It's a soft vine um, with these big tubular red flowers. And the hummingbirds just love that. That's one of my number one plants for them that I talk about on my radio show all the time. Milkweed, again, a lot of people think of milkweed for monarchs, but have you ever thought of milkweed for hummingbirds? If you've ever eaten one of these flowers, you know how sweet they are. And they're kind of perfectly, anything that's tube shaped or bell shaped like that, hummingbirds just love. They know just where to stick their beak in there to get the nectar. So milkweed, even the common milkweed is actually a great source of food for hummingbirds. Gill pie weed, another, another unusual one that people usually don't think of for hummingbirds because it's a big cluster of kind of fluffy, um, kind of pink fluffy flowers. But when you look closely, it's all these little tube shaped blossoms. So the hummingbirds know, as you can see in the picture, they know right where to stick their beak in to get the nectar out of there. Uh, black and blue salvia, one of the best plants for hummingbirds in general. This is an annual. Uh, it can be pretty big. It can grow four feet tall and four feet wide. Uh, cobalt blue with the black uh, bracts and stems, but it is like probably my number one plant for hummingbirds. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, you, you might have heard that myth that hummingbirds only like red flowers. Total lie, because hummingbirds absolutely love this plant. And if you've ever grown it, I'm sure a lot of you have, you, you know the hummingbirds come right to it. So it's a great one to grow. Anis hyssop or agastache, that's another great one for hummingbirds, especially because it blooms late. So the hummingbirds can find it when they're migrating through. Hummingbirds migrate through in late August and September. And that's just when this plant is blooming uh, and they can just fly up and down those little tube shaped flowers. If you look really close, there's all sorts of little tube shaped nectaries in there and the hummingbirds know just where to go. Royal catchfly is one of my favorite native wildflowers. These star shaped flowers are like two inches across. They're gorgeous. You don't find it for sale a lot of places. I usually get it at uh, Stone Silo Prairie Gardens up in De Pere, which is a native plant nursery. Uh, but the hummingbirds just love this one. Uh, and this blooms early in the summer, usually about July. Uh, so it gives them a lot of nectar in the middle of summer. Um, that was a salvia. That's not a very good picture. That's that lipstick salvia. <laughs> Turtle heads are great for hummingbirds again because they bloom late and they're a nice tube shaped flower. And hummingbirds just love those as they're migrating through especially. Bee balm, let's talk about bee balm and bergamot before. Um, those long things sticking up with a little fuzz at the end, the hummingbird sticks his beak way down in there. And you know hummingbirds have really long beaks and they get to that nectar that's down there. So all of the bee balms are great, not just for butterflies, but for hummingbirds also. Oh. That picture got kind of distorted. So bee balms are great for hummingbirds. Uh, this is another form of bee balm that most people aren't familiar with. It's a native one. It's called spotted bee balm, or some people call it dotted mint. Uh, it's actually a little bit different. It has spots, and then the bracts turn kind of purple. It's a very beautiful plant. This is another one that I usually get at Stone Silo uh, in De Pere. It's hard to find most other places, but it's a very cool uh, form of bee balm. Oops, I just got a lot of bee balm pictures. Agastashi, we talked about. Violets, again, one of the first things to bloom when the hummingbirds come back in the spring are violets. And I've actually seen hummingbirds sit on the ground, sticking their beak up in there, feeding on the violets. So um, sometimes they're desperate for food when they first get back, if it's been cold or if there's not a lot blooming yet. The wild blue flocks, and actually all the flocks, even your tall garden flocks in the summer are great for hummingbirds. Cardinal flower, another great one for late summer and fall. Bright, bright red, the hummingbirds just go up and down. These stalks can be four or five feet. A lot of you probably have cardinal flower in your garden. That's a great plant for hummingbirds, especially during their fall migration, which again, begins in late summer. And then there's great blue lobelia, which is a relative of cardinal flower. Wild columbine, another one that blooms in May when they're first coming back. Those, if you've ever eaten one of these or drank one of these, those big tall uh, nectaries are just loaded with sweet nectar and the hummingbirds know just how to get in there to get it. 
So wild columbine is a great one for hummingbirds. And if you've ever seen a hummingbird feeding off of it, it's incredible. They hover beneath the blossom and stick their beak straight up. This is Culver's root, which is another excellent one. Hummingbirds love tubular flowers like this. This is Hori vervain, V-E-R-V-A-I-N. That's another native wildflower in blue. Um, now I'm on to other trees for birds or other plants for birds. People, um, instead of just wildflowers, you can plant trees for birds too. Birches are one of the best plants overall for birds, especially in the winter, because right now the birch catkins are opening up and the old ones from last year are spilling their seed. And um, pine siskins and goldfinches and red poles are so busy up there in the trees. I noticed some at High Cliff just the other day. They're just up in the treetops, tearing apart these birch catkins, eating them right now. So birches are an excellent source of food for birds. Tamaracks, those little tiny cones are great for all of your birds also. All the evergreens really are excellent sources of food for birds. Uh, birches again. Uh, this is kind of cool. This is the pattern on this um, birch log. This is what the yellow-bellied sap sucker does to get the sap to well out. I showed you this guy. I showed you that before uh, in the beginning of the program. This is what that pattern looks like. So if you've ever seen this on a tree out in the woods, that's a yellow-bellied sap sucker um, well area. So they drill all these holes and they wait for the sap to start coming out and then they drink it up. So that's a very distinct um, calling card of this bird right here. Affiliated woodpeckers, um, <laughs> they obviously like some of those trees too, especially when there's big grubs in them. Here's a picture of a goldfinch eating the birch catkins. So these are the catkins that are on the birch trees right now. And this goldfinch, he's busy picking away. You can see there's literally hundreds and hundreds of little seeds in that birch catkin. So don't think that you have to have just little wildflowers and stuff for your birds. Trees are just as important for birds, um, for food as the smaller plants. Mountain ash is a great plant to have for birds. They love those red berries. They usually um, fruit out late in summer. Um, robins and wax wings and catbirds and tanagers, all sorts of birds eat those nice juicy little berries. Hickory nuts are great for birds. A lot of people don't think of hickory nuts for birds because squirrels usually get them, but turkeys and grouse and other birds eat the nuts. Uh, even wood ducks, if you know what a wood duck is, those really pretty rainbow ducks, wood ducks and other species of ducks eat the hickory nuts also. Cardinals, of course, they love all the treetops. They, they sing and, and enjoy themselves from up in the trees and they find a lot of different sources of food. In the summer, a lot of times their diet turns to caterpillars, just like this guy, the scarlet tanager. These guys are usually way up in the treetops and what they're looking for at that time of year are caterpillars and insects. They eat so many caterpillars and insects and so do Orioles. So all these mature trees uh, are great for all of these birds especially when they're feeding their young on the nest. They're looking for bugs to eat. Uh, and oak trees are amazing for birds as well. I think this is my last slide. Oak trees are great for birds because what happens is, um, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> the oaks, uh, I, you may have heard me say this before on my show, but oak trees, especially specifically in Outagamie County, there was a study done at Fallen Timbers Environmental Center up in Black Creek where one, I can't remember the guy's name off, the top of my head right now, but he did a specific study on oak trees and how many different species of moths and butterflies use them as a host plant. And he came up with like 700 different species right here in Outagamie County that use oak trees as host plants for their caterpillars. So the caterpillars provide food for these birds when they come back in spring and when they start nesting. So that's why oak trees are so important. And some of these caterpillars obviously are just moth caterpillars that are kind of pest uh, they're specifically made for food for orioles and tanagers and um, indigo buntings and grosbeaks and catbirds. All of these birds that are voraciously feeding their young, um, the oak trees are important because they are a host for so many different types of caterpillars. So sometimes some people don't always get that connection. And of course, acorns. This blue jay's got his throat patch stuffed full of acorns. You can see there's probably four or five in there. Uh, and that's what they do. They gather them up and then they take them and hide them. And of course, turkeys eat acorns too. So I believe that's probably my last slide. Awesome. Oops. Well, since we ran over, I do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, I'll just let it keep playing. There's going to be all different plants showing up. I'll just answer the questions. Okay. So if somebody has a peanut allergy, can will birds eat almond butter or safflower butter? Oh, definitely. Yep. You can just smear it on a board or something. In fact, I was when I was, there's actually an almond butter suet that people make. If you want to Google a recipe for it, 
It's a really easy suet to make with almond butter, or you can just smear it on branches and stuff like that. So, yep, it works. Or you can do the bird feeders with it, like we are showing you rolling into the paper or rolling it onto um, pine cones and stuff. But almond butter is actually, it'll work. And someone else was asking about a bird food that would be no waste. <clears throat> that's a good question. Okay, so that's another reason to go to these bird feed stores that I was talking about. They actually have specific mixes that are called, I think it's just called no mess mix. It's called a no mess mix where everything is, all the shells are taken off. So you just have the sunflower hearts, I believe, um, the safflower hearts and some other things where there is no waste. There's no millet, there's nothing with a shell. Um, it's a little more expensive because you're gonna pay for that work it took to, to get all those shells off. But if you're serious about not making a mess, then these no, and I think it is just called no mess mix. If you go to Wild Bird Backyard and ask her about it, I'm pretty sure she has it there. Um, as for Sue and tell her, tell her Rob sent you, I said hi. But um, the no mess mix is great. Or if you just buy separate bags of each one and just kind of makes your own, but she has a pre-made no mess mix. So you awesome. don't have mess or waste, yeah. Someone asked about lemons, if birds will eat lemons. Yes, especially your spring birds like um, tanagers and orioles and robins and wax wings and house finches, they'll all eat lemon and cat birds too. All right, and um, so citrus, really. Let's see, and someone has, um, they said their finches stopped eating their niger seed and they bought a new seed and sock and the birds are still ignoring it. Um, give it a little time. Um, you may want to move this, the feeder somewhere else. Um, I'm wondering, are the birds still there or are they just gone? Because I'm wondering if maybe there's a hawk or something in the area, but um, you might want to just move the feeder or just give it a little more time. Um, or depending where you've got the Niger seed again, if you can go somewhere and get it like, like locally at a reputable place. Um, you know, I just, I don't want people feeding Niger seed that, you know, it's coming from China or something. So maybe just try a better brand or a different brand, um, especially for one of the local places um, or just move the feeder or just make sure um, if the, the reason they're not coming isn't because of a hawk or something in the area or a cat or something. Um, okay. Okay, it looks like everything else was answered at some point in your presentation, so. Okay. Thank you. Well, good. I do have one question. I sure. few, uh, maybe a month ago, I bought a 50 pound bag of black sunflower seed from Menards. And the birds seem to be ignoring it. Uh, what's the difference between the black and the striped and uh, I primarily have goldfinches. They're actually outnumbering um, the um, house sparrows, which is, is neat, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so black oil, sunflower, and there are different sources. So, um, but I, if it was a month ago, you know, late December and early January, it, we really, there was really no need to feed birds. It was so, we didn't have any snow. It was warm. We had a green Christmas, a green New Year's pretty much. And the birds really didn't need our help back then. So it could have been just, they, they had plenty of wild food sources out there and they didn't really need to eat at that time. Now that we're getting more snow, um, well, are you still using that bag and they're just not coming? Yeah, because it could have been, it could have just been that they didn't need it at the time. Um, there are different places to get the black oil sunflower seeds. Some are better than others. Menards is usually pretty good. It's, it's fairly local. But um, it, it could just be also that, again, there, there are enough other food sources out there. Black oil sunflower seed usually is the number one uh, source of food for uh, wild birds. I just hope it wasn't like a, an older bag or you know that there wasn't uh, an issue with the seed itself. Um, maybe yeah, try- I hope not because I'm stuck with about 40 pounds yet. Oh, you still have it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe, try, maybe try cracking a few open and just seeing what they look like inside. Make sure there's a nice meaty heart in there. If it's rotten or something, then that could be the issue. Um, but maybe crack a few open and just see if there's a nice meaty sunflower heart inside of it. Okay. Or, or if they're dried up. Um, chances are now that it's getting a bit cold, they're going to they're gonna come looking for it. And they're going to find it. Well, it's frozen in the garage, so it's like a spoil. Oh, 
Yeah, could be. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck and kind of keep us posted. See what happens. Um, question any other questions? Not quite bird feeding related. They're wondering about how to care for bluebird swallowtail wren boxes and when is the best time to clean it out and if you should leave the door open in the winter until March to prevent mice. Um, so a lot of people do leave the door open in the winter and clean it out. Um, just be sure that you get it closed back up fairly early because bluebirds, people get surprised by how early bluebirds actually come back looking for these boxes. Sometimes they're back in late February. I mean, some bluebirds could be back in a couple of weeks already um, and they're looking for nest boxes at that time. They start scoping out their territory right away. Uh, some people wait too long. I've seen people wait until you know the middle of May to close up their bluebird houses and by then uh, it's way too late. Well, bluebirds usually do have a couple generations so they could come back and use it, but Get it closed up pretty early. It is a good idea to check it and clean it out really good. Um, some people do it every year in the winter. Some people let mother nature just do it. Uh, and sometimes um, people will leave them closed up in the winter because um, it's kind of surprising what you'll find there. Some people have told me they've found flying squirrels in their bluebird boxes in the middle of winter or chickadees just nestled in there in, in, in huge groups. I mean, you can pack like on nights like tonight or when it's below zero, sometimes, um, you can pack, you know, 15, 20 blue, uh, chickadees in a bluebird house, uh, and that's their winter survival right there. So some people keep them up just for that reason. Um, obviously, you don't want mice in there, but other things could come in there too. All right, and we have somebody asking about the food coloring in the hummingbird feeders. It's not needed. So yeah, that, that's pretty a, a common question, because again, kind of like when, when people say that Hummingbirds uh, only like red flowers. We already know that's a lie because of some of the plants I showed you. And it's the same thing with the nectar. Hummingbirds come to clear nectar. You don't have to put any food coloring in there. Um, it, it's a myth, so don't do that. Uh, and of course, just like our bodies, a lot of that food coloring uh, is toxic and, and they've been proving that not just to us, but to birds too. There's no need to put food coloring in your nectar. Um, so just do your sugar water and that's all you have to do. All right, great. That's it. Thank you all for coming and thank you. Roger, yes, thank you. Great information and get thank ready. You. Yep. And, and like I said, now is one of the best times to start bird feeding. Go, go pick up a couple bags of good quality food from one of those places I told you and um, either put out a board on, on a cinder block or something and, or get a, a, a nice feeder and stick it out there and a couple different kinds in a couple different places. And again, don't be surprised if the birds don't come, you know, as soon as you get back in the house. Sometimes it takes them a couple of weeks to find it, especially if a lot of your neighbors and stuff are feeding. But most birds in, in winter, they kind of roam around in these feeding flocks and they go from neighborhood to neighborhood throughout their territory and they'll find your feeder if it's out there. So good luck. All right, excellent. All right. Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rob. Yep. We'll be out feeding the birds. Thanks. Yep, bye. Bye.